Tube, Roxy and myself welcome you to the History Shelf. <sighs> Roxy wants to be my assistant, although she's sleeping on the job, um, for this another installment of Spotlight on one of my favorite military publishers, military history publishers, Casemate. And I have a pile, three piles to show you, and this will be a hands-free since I've gotten so many uh, positive comments about the hands-free and you guess guys get to see more of the insides of the book. So uh, let me start with, um, I got a, um, a bunch of new stuff which is in this pile over to my far right. I'm going to save those probably for a second video guys, so look out for a second Casemate Spotlight video. But I want to start with an exciting book out. I might have mentioned it already. But I want to say it again, my, um, my friend Colonel Keith Nightingale, retired, uh, has a brand new book out, which I plan to read and review on this channel, hopefully in the next couple of months, few months. Um, I have reviewed two of his books, um, um, and when I say friend, we became friends through my reading of his book, Just Another Day in Vietnam, uh, and we have corresponded um, but, uh, yeah, full disclosure, you know, um, uh, we are not related or anything, but we, I've just been really appreciative of his insights and his, um, his work. And uh, the other book review I did was Phoenix Rising, but now he has a brand new book out. And it's called The Human Face of D-Day, which I cannot wait to dive into. I think this is one of his biggest books so far, put out by Casemate. Uh, this came out, I just think, the last month. Um, and the subtitle is Walking the Battlefields of Normandy, Essays, Reflections, and Conversations with Veterans of the Longest Day. Um, I really appreciate he included some of his own photos. I believe he traveled over there to, to walk the area and do some interviews. Um, but it says here, Soldier Scholar Keith Nightingale has conducted terrain walks in Normandy. Uh, for over 40 years with veterans, active duty military, and local French civilians. Over the decades, he was privileged to conduct dozens of formal interviews and informal conversations with many of the principal um, principals of the day, including Generals Bradley, Collins, Gavin, Ridgway, and Hill. He also spent hours with the lower-ranking vets who did the heavy lifting. Many of the conversations took place walking the ground, including Bob Piper at Lafayette Bridge, Dick Winters at Braycourt Manor, who was uh, featured prominently in Band of Brothers, um, Silvio Marcucci on Omaha Beach, and Bud Lomel at Point du Hoc. So, combining the author's discussions with veteran and civilian participants in D-Day with his personal reflections on Operation Overlord, this is a unique collection of perspectives on the longest day. Um, and then we, what I really enjoyed too are his personal essays. Um, Colonel Nightingale is a very creative and um, creative writer. Um, I appreciate some of his more philosophic pieces. Interspersed with veterans' remarks, Nightingale's personal essays are inspired by specific discussions or multiple interviews. Taken together, the succinct human observations of these participants illuminate the hard facts to create a unique work of long-lasting interest that will entrance specialists, military history buffs like me, peg it to history shelf, uh, armchair, armchair generals and general readers alike. So, um, as you can see, he's got uh, just a mixture of type of, he's got combat orders, he's talking about the decision, we've got some of the original maps. Uh, so I am going to read this book and do a full review on my channel. So stay tuned in the coming months for that. And congratulations to Colonel Nightingale on his new book. Very excited for this next book. Um, kind of, uh, I'm getting branching out into some other areas from Casemate Publishing. I'm getting some some books on early American history as well as Civil War stuff, which I am stoked about. But this is War Along the Wabash, um, the Ohio Indian Confederacy's destruction of the U.S. Army, 1791, by Stephen P. Locke. Again, put out by uh, Casemate. There we go. Are we not focusing? Sure, we are. Uh, I thought I had a pub sheet for this, guys. I apologize, but let me just kind of open these up for you. We've got color inserts. Anyway, let me give you a rundown here. Um, 
On November 4th, 1791, a coalition of indigenous warriors determined, determined to set the Ohio River as a permanent boundary between their lands and white settlements destroyed an American army led by Major General Arthur St. Clair. I guess I could just focus in on that, huh? That's no fun. And then what Then what happened? I've got a couple of pub sheets, but not all of them. Um, the road to the Wabash began when St. Clair was appointed to lead an army into the heart of the Ohio Indian Confederacy, building a string of fortifications along the way. He would face difficulties in recruiting, training, feeding, and arming volunteer soldiers. From the moment the remnants of the shattered force began its retreat from the Wabash, the men would blame the officers for the catastrophe, and the officers, officers in turn blamed their men. For over two centuries, most historians have blamed either the officer corps, enlisted soldiers, an entangled logistical supply line, poor communications or equipment. Um, it says here, the result of 30 years research, this book puts the battle into the context of the last quarter of the 18th century. Fascinating. Um, exploring how the central importance of land ownership to Europeans arriving in North America resulted in unrelenting demographic pressure on, on indigenous tribes. Um, this is the story of how a small band of determined indigenous peoples defended their homeland, destroyed an invading American army, and forced a fundamental shift in the way in which the United States, States waged war. So I am excited for some early American history from Casemates. I'd love to see some more uh, of it. But uh, this is brand new out right now. You can look for it at your favorite bookstore and or library. And Midway Submerged, American and Japanese Submarine Operations at the Battle of Midway, May, June, 1942, by Mark W. Allen. All right. Uh, so this is your, your, st your standard type of... Oh, this one's very... Oh, that's an appendix. Half the book is an appendix or in, in bibliography and notes, I think, so... End notes, yep, appendix stuff. Okay. So, the book itself, minus the appendix, is about 100 pages. Um, so, let's see, what is he trying to do with this work? Um, Midway Submerged presents detailed arguments regarding the tactics employed in the U.S. strategy for the Battle of Midway and effectively argues that submarine warfare played a greater role in the battle's outcome than previously thought. Um, all right. He concludes that the Japanese defeat should not be blamed on ineffective submarine tactics. Instead, Allen advocates a closer inspection of the overall Japanese strategic plan. And that hence Midway Submerged, all about the um, submarine warfare. So, very short, kind of preshy on this. Uh, and we'll see if he can, he uh, kind of lives up to his argument here on you know, submarine warfare playing a larger role than previously thought. Then we have this. I thought this was interesting. The One Ship Fleet, USS Boise, Boise, uh, <laughs> as they say. I guess you have to be very, um, if you're from Idaho, people you know, take that seriously, how you pronounce. Is it Boise or Boise? I don't know. Uh, w, no, WW2, World War II Naval Legend, 1938 to 1945. So the One Ship Fleet, and this is by Philip T. Parkerson. This is new, out from... Uh, Casemate right now. What are we looking at here? Let's take a look at some of the get some of the benefits of the hands-free. Very nice. It's all flack right there. Casemate books are just well put together. They're well designed. The paper is outstanding quality. It never never fades. Never yellows. Um, they, they're a bit more in cost, but uh, in price, but uh, you pay for quality, so these books are always going to, they're going to stand the test of time here. Great maps. Um, all right, so let's get, to get a feel for this. Um, you, light cruiser USS Boise was one of the most famous U.S. combat ships in World War II, internationally renowned following her participation in the naval battles of the Solomons in 1942. She went on to serve in the invasions of Sicily, Toronto, and Salerno before returning to the Pacific, joining the U.S. 7th Fleet, 
for the campaign in New Guinea and the invasion of the Philippines, fighting in the Battle of Leyte Gulf and serving as MacArthur's flagship. By the end of the war, USS Boise had been awarded 11 battle stars, more than any other light cruiser in the Brooklyn class. This full account of USS Boise's war not only gives an insight into how one ship navigated a global conflict, but also into the experiences of the men who served on her, including the author's father, oh, Avery Parkerson, and a new perspective on the naval campaigns of the war. Some good stuff here. So one, The One Ship Fleet by Philip T. Parkerson. Now this is a nice colorful book. This, this, was, uh, this is from Osprey. Um, and this is by Angus Constant. This is 100 Greatest Battles. This is just, and you know this has the artwork that Peggy loves. Oh my gosh, look at that. Like this is like artwork straight out of my Ancient Warfare magazine and stuff. I love this. So as you can see, there's a list of um, battles, uh, the, a lot of them in the ancient world. We've got medieval, rena renaissance, age of reason, the Napoleonic era. Of course, we've got uh, age of empires, World War One. They should have, where is... So the age of empires, they have civil war stuff kind of buried in here. Just to, uh, we got First Bull Run, Vicksburg, Gettysburg. And then you got the World Wars and then the modern age. Um, and they're just... One, two pagers. I think I had one uh, that had like 50 of the greatest Civil War battles, but as you can see, like there's the Battle of Hatton, 1817. Everything fits on these two facing pages Hastings, Tours, uh, Zama, and fantastic artwork throughout. There's Vicksburg. These are fun. These are fun, and I think these might, after I read these, I'll probably send, I don't know, I think these would be good for like a young child, or studying history, or send it, you know, give it, donate it to a school. Um, but uh, this is fantastic. So this is out right now from Osprey. All right, guys, I'm really excited about this one here. Civil War. Hood's defeat near Fox's Gap, Prelude to Emancipation, by Curtis L. Older. I gotta get my glasses on, guys. Can you believe this? All right, I'm gonna make sure that, okay, that is focusing. And I have a pup sheet, so you can look at the book while I read. What? So Hood's defeat near Fox's Gap is an exceptional analysis of Confederate Brigadier General John Bell Hood's troop movements during the Battle of South Mountain. All right, oh, let's see here. For the past 160 years, all other authors misplaced Hood's troop positions on the Fox's Gap battlefield by approximately a half mile. The actual location of Hood's attack reconfigures the entire placement of the competing forces in the battle and thus the conclusions one makes about the struggle. Um, our other authors did not correctly analyze the geography and topography of the battlefield. The failure to understand the topog topographical characteristics of the battlefield led other writers to make false assumptions about Hood's movement. Before the publication of Hood's defeat near Fox's Gap, the battle for Fox's Gap in South Mountain was never accurately reported or understood. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, so some of the key features of this book they're saying is that um, it overturns all previous accounts of the Union strategy at the battle, the author proves that Confederate casualties at the battle have consistently been understated. I'm not surprised. Um, in light of, like, you know, lost cause stuff. Garbage. Um, geographical and topographical evidence demonstrate that all previous accounts of Hood's attack on the Union defenses placed Hood in the wrong position. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, kind of revisionist battle uh, uh, battlefield um, history here. Or, re you know, I like it. Ooh. All right, so I'm kind of excited for this, guys. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how he, he, he brings this into the, if it's just strictly a military, but prelude to emancipation. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I'll let you know if you're interested in hearing my thoughts on this. Hood's, Hood's defeat at near Fox's Gap. Okay. 
is next on the horizon? I have to take... Well, speaking of horizon, how about a burning horizon? What? British veteran accounts of the Iraq... That was me opening a drink, sorry. British veteran accounts of the Iraq War, 2003, by Julian Whippy. It's forwarded by, many of you will know this name, Dr. Peter Caddick Adams, who has written the fantastic trilogy, as I zoom up, there we go, snow and steel, sand and steel, fire and steel, Peter Caddick Adams, and now we zoom back in. Peggy is desperately trying to make space for all of her... Yes, I'm talking in the third person. <laughs> Peggy has a lot of periodicals that she needs to get to. <laughs> and I need to do a lot of... Uh, uh, re shelving and removing things and updating the shelves. I'm running out of some space here. But we've got Burning Horizon. And I have a pup sheet, which is fantastic! So, codenamed Operation Telic, the British component of the invasion of Iraq in 2003, was the largest gathering of British troops since the Second World War. Uh, while the British public prepared for the worst as its soldiers were facing weapons of mass destruction, most servicemen and women, let's see if I can find something in here, um, were under no illusion that they were invading Iraq to rid the people of Saddam Hussein. While much has been said about WMD and Tony Blair's government, not nearly enough has been heard from those men and women that took part in Operation Telic. So based on dozens of veteran interviews, personal diaries, and archival material, this book tells their stories in their own words. Oops, the cauldron. Okay. Um, it says uh, polarized Polarized public opinion and the post-war media portrayal of the war has detracted from what was achieved by these forces um, when tasked to do so, often with insufficient or inadequate resources. Well, here we go. Um, these are their stories of courage, fortitude, pride, and brotherhood amidst the harsh realities of modern asymmetric warfare. Fabulous. It's interesting, you know. I never really think about what, how the British, uh, the British veterans were impacted, and what people thought about the war. So, Burning Horizon by Julian Whippy, out now. From Casemate. I think I might have shown this one already, but if I haven't, I'm going to do it now. This is Immigrant Warrior, a challenging life in war and peace from the Cold War to Vietnam and beyond. Um, and this is by Henrik Olund, Colonel of Infantry, U.S. Army, retired. Look at that. This is a very thick book. Ooh. Um, let's see here. This is about Henrik Lund. Henrik Lund grew up in Norway and came to the United States with his parents as a teenager. After completing high school, he attended the University of California at Berkeley. There we go. Um, graduating in 1958 as the honor graduate in the history department. And he also received an appointment in the regular army. Lucky you. <laughs> um, after the basic infantry officer, ranger, and airborne forces, and his first duty station with the 2nd Battle Group 6th Infantry Regiment in Berlin, Hank spent 18 months with the Covert Special Forces Unit, unit in Berlin. In 1963, oh, that's his father right here. This is cool. That's his father in the World War I uniform. Interesting. Um, in 1963, he attended the Infantry Officer Career Course at Fort Benning and was designated an honor graduate. He then attended the Elite Pathfinder Course before reporting to Fort Campbell, Kentucky for assignment to the Elite 101st Airborne uh, Division. Very storied, uh, and storied and famous 
unit um, that has seen its share of war and bloodshed. Um, very proud unit. He de deployed to Vietnam with the 1st first, first Brigade, 101st Airborne Division in 65. For most of his tour, he commanded a rifle company. On his return to the States, Hank worked as branch chief at the Airborne Test Division at Fort Bragg, which I think is now going to be renamed something else. I think Fort Cavazos. Um, don't quote me on it, but I think so. Still, at the end of 1967, he volunteered for the 9th Division in the Delta in the Delta, despite becoming disillusioned with the tactical strategic conduct of the war. In the 9th Division, he served as Brigade S3 and Battalion XO. He then moved to the Vietnamese 2nd Corps as Deputy Operations Advisor. Um, so this is his story. I mean, this is... Um, it's a, uh, this, this memoir is a unique insight into the mind of a combat leader par excellence. Okay, so this is a memoir. Yeah, okay. And you know I love military and war memoirs, so this is going to be great. And when you say immigrant warrior, wow. I don't know, for some reason you don't think of Norway, but that's, yes, he's an immigrant. Interesting how this cover is blending in with my carpet. <laughs> this is like camouflage. You could just, this book could just sink right in. I wouldn't see it. <laughs> oh, God. But, okay, so Immigrant Warrior by Henrik Lund. I'm looking forward to reading this. This is out now. Another great book from Casemate. Now I get to show you some really interesting titles from one of their series I really enjoy, which is Century of the Soldier. I'm going to go in order of the numbers on this. This is number 90. Uh, okay. Yeah, one of these I got in hardcover, which I've never gotten hardcover before. Oh, uh, where are we at? 21 minutes. Okay. So, let me show you from the side. These are beautiful, glossy, uh, richly, densely packed, uh, richly illustrated, densely packed books in the Century of the Soldier 1618 to 1721 series. I have a few of these already, uh, already on my shelves. I believe I've shown them to you as they've trickled in over the years. Um, but for some reason, I just got... Uh, I got really, um, I was very blessed to have received uh, seven, seven of these in the series, their most recent ones. And let's start with number 87. This is Charles X's Wars. Um, and now it's volume two. I don't have volume one. Uh, volume two, The Wars in the East, 1655 to 16, 1657. Okay, so you see number 87. It's by Michael Fredholm von Essen, and uh, we, the purpose of the series, um, oh, see what I'm talking about? This is why I really wanted to do the hands-free. I wanted to really, I wish I could give you a, a sense of what these pages smell like. They're just glossy, as you can see. Delicious. They smell delicious. <laughs> um, yeah, so the Century of the Soldier series, um, Covers the period, obviously from the period I told you, uh, 1618, 1721, the golden era of pike and shot warfare. So, um, this is the period of military revolution, the development of standing armies, the widespread introduction of black powder weapons, and a greater professionalism within the culture of military personnel. Um, also, as a time of fundamental developments within military matters. So. That's the whole point of the series, and they go into a variety of different wars to, to analyze that. So Charles X's Wars um, analyzes the Swedish deluge, the devastating 1655 to 1660 wars fought between Sweden, the Polish, Lithuanian Commonwealth. These are these are the wars I really don't know much about, and I really want to start understanding. Um, so these books are going to be a great doorway in, um, as well as. These bibli the bi bibliography is going to really help me too. If I find something of particular interest, um, I can I can dig deeper. And these are going to be outstanding uh, resources and books too. Uh, and a lot of these are in another language, but that goes to show you, the man's done his research. Research. Um, anyway, so these are the wars fought between Sweden, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, Brandenburg, Prussia, Muscovite Russia, Transylvania. Cossack Ukraine, the Tatar Khanate of Crimea, and the Holy Roman Empire during the reign of Swedish King Charles X Gustavus. 
Gustavus, an experienced former general from the Thirty Years' War. By invading uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, King Charles saw an opportunity to put an end to the Polish king's claim to the Swedish throne and to gain additional territories which would enable him to control the Baltic Sea maritime trade. All right, so it focuses on the Swedish Commonwealth War, which provoked the political and military collapse of the Commonwealth. It's interesting, but it can't be disentangled from other wars. So, I mean, it's just going to, yeah. <laughs> these are all things I need to learn. Um, look at these guys here. Battle of War Warsaw right here. Look at this. It's just, they're, they're beautiful books. They are beautiful books. They are well worth uh, an investment. Oh, look at that. These are the battle flags, or the regimental flags. Um, it's fantastic. They don't stint on just rare, you know, uh, replications of, oh gosh, artwork. Um, you know, line drawings, uh, just amazing. Love it, you guys. Okay, so that's number 87. I'm having to rest my leg on this camera stand because it will tip over again. I think in the first video, you s oh, the first video, I... Not for don't mind me, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the next one is number 88. Wait, I'm missing 88. Uh, I might have to get number 88, so... <laughs> I'm a completionist. We have number 89, Campaigns of the Eastern Association. The Rise of Oliver Cromwell, 1642 to 1645. This is something I really wanted to take a look at because I just recently read and reviewed um, a brand new book on the English Civil Wars. Uh, it was by Jonathan Healy, and it's called The Blazing World. I highly recommend it. Um, I've reviewed it and I've linked to it on my social my social media, which you can find in the description box. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook. The History Shelf is uh, on all of those places, and as well as my Twitter handle. But uh, The Blazing World talked about Oliver Cromwell, and I wanted to learn more. Um, so this is fantastic. This is by Lawrence Spring. Um, it says here... The Eastern Association is best known for its performance at the Battle of Marston Moor and for the rise of Oliver Cromwell, but it was so much more. It was one of the most successful parliamenta parliamentarian armies that served during the First Civil War, firstly having to secure the counties of East Anglia from royalist sympathizers and then supporting Lord Fairfax's Northern Association in its struggle with Newcastle's army and the latter's final defeat at the Battle of Marston Moor. It then assisted the remains of the Earl of Essex's army and Sir William Waller's at the Second Battle of Newbury. Using contemporary and archaeological evidence, this book looks at these two battles as well as Gainsborough and Winsby and the sieges of Reading, Kings Lynn, Lincoln, and York. But it, there's more. There's so much more, as you can see from this description. Uh, it goes into the religious and political divisions uh, within the armies caused by the Presbyterians and Cromwell's independent factions. Uh, yeah, Civil War is just like factions within factions within factions. Uh, it's crazy. Um, so I thought this is going to be a really good place to kind of, you know, there we go again. There's a regiment, regimental uh, the flags. Rec recreations of those. Um, Marston Moor, Siege of York. Um, Newark. Sir Thomas Fairfax there. So, beautiful books, y'all. I just love these. Um, I should say that these are the imprint is Helion and Company. Casemate carries uh, the, all of the Helion and Company um, productions, publications, and um, I'm just really, really excited for this one. Now, one of the newer ones, this is number 90, I believe. So, I'm missing... Yeah, missing 88. So this kind of follows along with Oliver Cromwell. This is the first time I've ever seen one of these in hardcover. This is the Army of Occupation in Ireland, 1603 to 1642, defending the Protestant hegemony by Malcolm Wanklin. Um, 
an interesting cover. I think it's a naked hard, you know, hard, naked hard cover, right? Um, they usually, I think they start off as hardcover and then they reprint them as um, these these really beautiful soft covers. So we got that going on in there. The first 30 years. Glossy, slick pages, gorgeous. Um, established in 1603, the army was initially composed almost entirely of English officers and soldiers for the first 30 years of his, his existence. The army's strength waxed and waned, and in accordance with the English government's assessment of the security insist the army's strength waxed and waned in accordance with the English government's assessment of the security situation in Ireland. However, during the governorship of Thomas Wentworth, it was seen as, po as a possible instrument for enforcing royal rule in all three of the Stuart kingdoms. Okay, so two books sure to piss off Martine. <laughs> She, I mean, you don't want to mention Oliver, you don't want to mention Oliver Cromwell and Margaret Thatcher around Martine. She's, she's Irish. She's an Irish lady f through and through. Um, so this looks really interesting. Uh, that's, that's number 90 in the series. And then we've got, there we go, I started to lose the camera again. I have to figure out a way to do this. Okay. Number 91, and then we'll wrap up after I finish these, and then look for um, video number two with more casemate. Number 91 in the series, look at this. The Armies and Wars of the Sun King, 1643, 1715, Volume 5. So obviously I'm missing a bunch, but it's okay, I'm happy to, to read this one. Volume 5 is Buccaneers and Soldiers in the Americas by Rene Chartrand. Uh, Okay, again, just beautifully, they're beautifully put together. Um, Buccaneers and Soldiers in the Americas. Ooh! This is why I love the hands free. Look at this. I can just kind of just, you guys can just gaze on this beauty. War of the Spanish Succession. That's another war I've never fully understood because it seems so complicated. Can anyone, does anyone have a formula to make me understand this, the War of the Spanish Succession? <laughs> that can help me to remember it easily and uh, all the different factions and who was against who and oi. Oh, this is fantastic though. Look at these plates, these color plates. It's just a military historian delight, which is me. I love it. Okay. I'm an unusual egg. I, um, I'm sure there are other, I mean, there are other female, in, you know, women historians out there that enjoy military history. I just don't see them very often. I mean, I might see a book published by a, a woman, but I don't know. I don't know if women have taken much interest in military history, but I have... All right, so what do we have here? Louis the Fourteenth, France's Sun King, uh, had grand visions for his nation overseas. In the Americas, his transformation of struggling small Caribbean settlements into an extensive and very prosperous French domain amidst many challenges and battles is mostly unknown. This study is offered thanks to research mostly in France's overseas archives. In its first eight chapters, covering the 16th to the early 18th centuries, the book describes how the West Indies and much of coastal Latin America were engaged in near-perpetual hostilities, largely caused by the fantastic riches found in America. Okay, I don't want to read all of this for you guys, but... Uh, well, it looks fantastic. Um, it covers all the different fighting troops that came to um, the, the colonies in America, um, regular French troops, uh, Buccaneers or Brethren of the Coast, amongst the most redoubtable warriors in history, bent upon revenge upon any Spaniards. Um, oh, through them, the Sun King saw the opportunity to secure his small islands and Guiana, and we know that name is infamous for another reason, uh, by sending troops, ships, and weapons while more discreetly providing much official support to Buccaneers in Saint Domingue. 
Oh, this is, woo, this looks great. So this is volume five in the series and makes me curious about the other volumes. So I'm going to have to look those up. That's number 91. Moving on to number 92. It's a little slimmer volume, but we've got New Worlds, Old Wars, the Anglo-American Indian Wars of 1607 to 1678 um, by David Childs. Should do that so it will stay up. They always have a very nice introductory or preface chapter to get your feet wet about what you're about to to uh, undertake here. Oh yeah, we're missing the sound of the. You gotta love the. Can you, I wish you could smell the pages. <laughs> Um, lots of uh, illustrations. This is great. This is definitely closer to home. Um, and just the very earliest, you know, we're talking right after, um, 1607. Let me see if we've got Roanoke in here. Well, there's no, we've got, okay, we've got in, indexes, I don't have a, I mean, we have appendices, I don't have an index, but um, the first Abenaki War, 1675 to 1678, it's fantastic, we go to Maine, oh yeah, King Philip's War, that was uh, another book, or another war that I, I have read briefly about, I want to go deeper into King Philip's War, actually. So what are we looking at here? From the moment English settlers arrived in the New World, they encountered the native population. Come here, Roxy. You're not doing a good job assisting, um, principally due to disputes over land ownership, to assert their rights to the country which the English had been granted by their king without the consent of the local tribes. The English relied on their more modern weaponry. Hmm. Um, so basically, it's going through those wars with, with the uh, indigenous Native Americans. I've got to let Roxy out of the room. Please feast your eyes on that while I, I take care of Miss Missy. Okay. Don't go anywhere. Oh, well, okay. Just for a second. Go. Oh. Just go inside. You want it out, go. Well, you know how dogs are. Now she doesn't want to go. You're going to have to wait. I have two more books to show. We have number 92. We had 92. This is 93. Against the Deluge. Or Delu Deluge. Polish and Lithuanian armies during the war against Sweden, 1655 to 1660, which kind of follows along to what we were just talking earlier. This is by Michael Paradowski. Um, nice forward here. Note on the sources. Um, so this kind of follows along, if I may, with, yeah, Charles the Wars, because this one kind of focused on Charles the Tenth's side. This is kind of focusing on the Polish and Lithuanian armies that had to deal with Sweden. So I like that we're getting both, um, you know, sides of this. Lances, sabers, and muskets. As you can see, it kind of, these are the chapters that, you know, what they focus on. Ooh, look at that. That's amazing. There's a lot on lances, sabers, and then we got the commanders. Um, any, everything you can imagine, just a, a very academic work, but pleasantly displayed with uh, wonderful graphics. And I don't know. I just, I just love these books. What else can I say? I'm just uh, preaching to the choir here. So that's kind of a piece with this book here. All right, then the final one that I wanted to show you, oh, which kind of follows on this one, 
um, as, as it does, because this is Volume 2. I don't have Volume 1. But here is Charles the Tenth's Wars, Volume 3. And this is the Danish Wars, 1657 to 1660. Charles the Tenth was a busy man. And this is also by Michael, obviously that makes sense. Michael Fredholm von Essen has written both of these, and then I need to get Volume 1 to really feel like I've got a full picture. As you can see, it would end with the death of King Charles. Um... This is a big, hefty book. This one's over 400 pages. Um, yeah, this is awesome. Fantastic. These are wonderful collections to have if you can you finagle it. Um, just beautiful. I'm just so amazed. Oh, this one has like... <gasps> look at that. It's got some... Uh, Oh, this is the epidemic. But that's like blood. What is, uh, does anyone, what does it say here on the overleaf? Wow. Oh, here we go. Overleaf, the daily clothes and baldric worn by Admiral Clays Bilkin Stierna during the 1659 campaign. The blood stains derived from a serious wound he sustained when hit by a round shot. Can you imagine going to war in this? I mean, you might as well just be wearing, like, a negligee. Look at this. Wow. Yep. Yep, that's warfare. So, uh, this book describes and analyzes the two devastating wars fought between Sweden and Denmark-Norway during the reign of King Charles II Gustav of Sweden. Sorry, not the second. Charles X Gustav of Sweden, an experienced former general of the Thirty Years' War. So, the Dano-Swedish War of 1657 to 58 was initiated by King Frederick III of Denmark-Norway, who saw an opportunity to recover the territories lost in 1645 and attack Sweden while the Swedish king was fighting two simultaneous wars in the east. Right, right, against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, we're looking at right here, um, and Muscovite Russia. Oh. See, <laughs> Mike, Michael Friedholm von Essen presents new research on two wars rarely described in English. So this is very fantastic. This is very fantastic. I should say that. This is very fantastic. Um, wow. Uh, like I said, I, I just, I'm so impressed with the Century of the Soldier series um, by Helian and Company that a casemate puts out. So I just wanted to share with you. Hopefully, you did not uh, get vertigo seeing that camera fall again. Um, I wanted to share with you some of these. Wonderful new titles from Casemate, and I've got more to show you, so let me wrap up. Let me know what you thought of this video, if you're still enjoying the hands-free approach, and uh, any if you have any other improvements that you suggest I can, I can uh, incorporate, let me know. Uh, thanks, BookTube. We'll see you soon at the History Shelf.